Thanks for joining me today and letting me bellow on about a topic near and dear to my heart, the Viking world. In order to talk about Viking bellows, we need to put them into their context, both in terms of use and in terms of archaeology. A wood fire burns around 500 and 900 degrees Celsius. In order to do a lot of the fun parts about the Viking world, we need to actually increase that temperature fairly significantly. Bead making, blacksmithing, smelting iron, we're looking at at least 1,000 if not 1,400 degrees. In order to get to those temperatures, fire needs help, and that help comes in the form of air from bellows. Miriam Legault wrote an interesting paper, How the Wind Blows. I'm actually looking forward to seeing it myself. It's the session immediately before mine, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I hope to. In her paper, she looks at pot bellows, she looks at bag bellows, does a few measurements. One of the pieces she calls out as needing to be studied is the Viking double bellows, and I'm happy to produce that for her. Um, it's also several questions that I feel need to be examined that are missing in her paper, and I want to extend in that way as well. The Norse bellows have two pieces of archaeology that support them. The first is this carved panel from the Hillstad Church. That lower panel expands up to show this blacksmith and this bellows in operation. We also have the Rasmin stone, which shows this little tranquil bellows usage. And when we zoom in on it, we can see here. What's nice about it is, in both of these cases, we have several measurements, both in terms of angles of use, but also lengths, widths, that we can take and work with. The carvers have also thoughtfully provided us with a large number of body part measurements that we can use to help scale those bellows. Now, before we proceed any further, we have to pay attention to a couple of points. For example, they weren't paying a huge amount of attention to accuracy when doing this. This unfortunate blacksmith, for example, has a head larger than his forearm, and this fellow over here has a hand larger than his head. So we're going to have to take any given measurement with a grain of salt but hopefully there is something that can be gained from these bits and pieces. In order to put those pieces together, we need to start with a catalog of human measurements. Thankfully, NASA has such a catalog, and it can be used in this way. This allows us to take the average size of a human hand, scale those drawings with the hands against the bellows, build out an option. Building out one for each of those available red line measurements, and then averaging those out gives us some really intriguing information. These bellows cannot be shorter than 12 centimeters and probably are not longer than 138 centimeters. And yes, that's quite the range. Their average length, however, especially when you look at the average and median, is fairly tight in around 40 centimeters plus or minus. The width I measure here is about 40% of the overall length. We see them in use with bellows angles at 45 degrees and 109 degrees. And this raises a point that kinesiology can't be ignored. We have humans in the usage of bellows. And the human being, his own size and shape, colors that usage. It's uncomfortable to make certain measurements when things are too heavy, too wide, too large. 109 degrees as an angle to move a bellows is actually extremely large. There were three recreations that were used as a part of this experiment. They were all built by Daryl Markowitz based on his own versions of those measurements we just talked through. And here you'll see all three are in the range of 50 to 55 centimeters long, around 25 to 30 centimeters across, running about 16 liters of volume. A couple of other measurements like the joint angle thrown in there for Miriam Legault because it is actually a significant question she asks. In normal operation, a Norse double bag bellows draws air in through these large ports you see here that the Ramston so stone puts on top. You will occasionally see these bellows inverted in use in some environments. The one photo picture we have, though, does put them on the top. Air flows out through the tuyere, and we need to be careful that we're not getting backflow. When the end of that tuyere is sitting in a 1200 degree fire, the last thing we want is that air being drawn back into our wooden leather environment. There are two primary ways to accomplish that. One is to throw a flap across the outputs of the beach bellows bag in order to make it a one-way valve. The other is to understand the flow of the air through the system, a snap of the wrist. Now here you see the business end of the dual bag. The top bag the flap that you can see to the left and the right 
is actually quite dark. That's because that top bellows bag is in the lowered position. There's no air left in it, nothing to hold that flap closed, and it can be lifted at this point, drawing in air. The lower bag is completely full and has been snapped down, and the pressure of the contained air is pushing that flap up, sealing this hole and forcing the air out the opening, the tuyere. By maintaining a constant flow out through the tuyere, we also prevent a flow back in. In order to do that, however, the timing on the bellows has to be precise. The second bellows bag must be loaded and started before the first bellows bag completely exhausts. And that brings our attention to the pacing. How many beats per minute should we be running with these bellows? A bellows in the, of this style has a natural fall rate. If you raise it and let it go, it will seal, it will slowly drop, exhausting the air out the tuyere. We can change that fall rate and the pressure involved by adding a weight onto the system, or we can do this all manually lifting up and pressing down with a snap of the wrist will drive the system. In all cases, we need to make sure that our beats per minute is high enough that we don't ever allow a bag to empty out completely. In the experiment that we run here, this is the equipment layout. It begins with a pressure sensor that you can see here, an expansion chamber to fit the anemometer, a sequence of 7.5 centimeter tubes empty in this particular configuration, with spare tubes beside full of charcoal. Those represent the load. At the far end is a float tube. That allows us to put a weighted float in and examine the airflow pattern as it moves up and down. And at this end, we have a height indicator, a maximum lift point that is set for each bellows. In actual run, each run lasts two minutes of data gathering, hooked up to the computer you see there on the right and we do three runs for every set of variables. In an attempt to eliminate as much as possible the skill of the bellows operator, the pace is set on a metronome and the plates are lifted to touch the limiting bar and then simply released. That allows them to fall either naturally or with weights. And runs are done with anywhere from zero to four tubes full of charcoal. The float heights are recorded on a video and then transcribed into a graph. Preliminary results show a couple of flaws fairly rapidly in this environment. The first is on the left, we see the anemometer spinning up to speed as the bellows is used, and on the right, we see it falling off to zero again as the bellows is stopped. Vein type anemometers, such as the Maztec that we're using, actually are an averaging system and need time to come up to their steady state. Once they hit that steady state, though, the airflow is fairly stable, which is good to see. Unfortunately, that mass tech unit has a limit. It can only record one sample per second. Given that we're looking here at 72 beats per minute, we're changing that airflow in fractions of a second. And the anemometer itself simply isn't sensitive enough, enough to keep up with the overall pacing. In addition, we found that the pressure sensor we were using lacked the sensitivity necessary. It only reads down to 1 one hundredth of a bar, and we are seeing pressure changes far below that level. As a result, here there are no pressure readings. When we move past that, we can actually examine the formal results. If we simply store the steady state, ignoring the ramp up and ramp down time, and average that load across each of the runs, we wind up with this graph for the first bellows. And here what you can see is, at zero grams of weight, 72 beats per minute, 382 grams, 84 beats per minute, and so on, including a manual run for comparison purposes, what the actual volume of air produced is under all of the variable load conditions. The first observation is quite intriguing. The load itself is non-linear in its response. The in installation of even that single first 7.5 centimeter tube of charcoal has a significant impact on the volume of air flowing. The next 7.5 centimeters has less, the next even less. And with the final load, we often see this reversing where our actual flow increases which is intriguing. It's also worth pointing out the volume of air produced is impacted by the rate at which you are working the bellows. And the rate is changing here from 72 to 84, and in the manual case, 115 beats per minute. That is tweaking this graph in a slight way that gives a, a misconception of the results. 
If, however, we transfer to efficiency, we compare what is actually being output against the theoretical output of these bellows at this pacing, we get a system that is independent of the rate. And here we can see some slightly better results. With no load on the system, as we increase the weight, the efficiency drops. But with a load, the efficiency remains quite constant for a given load. The float pattern also provides us some intriguing results. Now, the floats themselves need to be changed. As you might have noticed, the airflow changes fairly radically, as a result of which the weight of the float needs to change. I had floats ranging from less than a gram to greater than five grams at play and often was changing the weight of a float by adding a single square centimeter of cardstock or about 0.02 grams to the float to adjust it to get it to be visible within the tube on the videos. That changing of weight means that the absolute position of these lines on the vertical axis is irrelevant. And in fact, I've played with them to give us a visual stacking of the three results for bellows one with zero grams and a 72 beat per minute rate. This allows us to line up according to time frames on the bottom and according to uh, pacing. What's intriguing here is that we are seeing the pattern that we'd hope to see as a part of these floats. There is a regular repeating double peak with valleys to either side. Even more intriguing is that as the load increases, the total range from the bottom of the valley to the top of the peak, the middle valley and the top peak again, actually is compressed. That load is acting as a moderator for the airflow moving through it. When we look at all three bellows, comparing the efficiency across the various loads, that pattern that we saw, a high fall off, a slight leveling out, and then a slight uptick with the fourth load, is actually maintained across all four bellows. A very interesting result. And that brings us to the discussion. That nonlinear response to the load actually is a key point. It means that when we're studying the bellows, we actually have to study them as a part of the system that they are being used in. If we're expecting a given load, we should be checking those bellows, making our measurements against an equivalent load. That uptick at four loads is absolutely fascinating. At this moment, I don't actually have a theory for what's going on there. I'm very interested in exploring that. This whole experiment was also laid out in order to eliminate the skill of the bellows operator. All we were doing here is lift, touch the bar, remove the hand, let the weight, whether 0, 770, 382 grams, drive the bellows plate down. We kept the manual runs in because in order to do so, it provides us a counter check against the weights. Are we getting a reasonable behavior? But a skilled bellows operator actually has a capability of feedback through the bellows itself, adjusting the pressure exactly to meet the pushback received from the load. And that means that the weights need to be fine-tuned on any given run in order to optimize how the bellows works. It also stresses that we need to pay attention to the skill of the operator in our experiments. Miriam Legault made a really intriguing observation as part of her experiments, the percentage of time at which the airspeed was zero. That's a fascinating observation. I'm really glad she thought of it. She points out, however, that the measurement limit of the pitot tubes that she's using is 7 meters per second. One of the things I wanted to point out is that that would mean that on these tests, 100% of them are going to be zero according to her test. We never had a speed in excess of 3 meters per second throughout this entire experiment sequence. In the future, where do we need to take these experiments? First is equipment upgrades. The vein anemometers have to go. That new Omega system is an intriguing one. It uses temperature variance to measure wind speed. It's a much smaller unit, and it runs at four measurements per second, which is much more responsive. We're going to need a more responsive pressure gauge as well. We need to do some additional runs, fine-tuning those weights, trying to optimize. Straight up, more runs to add to that data set that we have. Three runs is entirely adequate. The results are fairly close across those three runs but raising it to five or seven would actually have value as well. And then finally, we have one additional bellows unit that we'd like to involve, a significantly larger one, put it on the same test harness and generate measurements from it as well. I'm looking forward to the question and answer session and any questions you have. And if you're viewing this after the conference, 
Here's how you can reach out and contact me with any questions that you might have. Thank you for joining me today and granting me the time of listening to me. I appreciate it.